All right. The red button and it says recording. There you go. Oh. All right. How's that? Excellent. That's good. Can you? You want to if I, yeah, if, if, if you could do that for me, please, as we go along, that'd be excellent. Uh, good evening. My name is Tony Johnson, and I know that uh, you don't have a lot of time here. I mean, it, normally this takes about, it's about a 45-minute thing, so I'm going to talk fast. But, but it, it, this begins to understand the whole story uh, in uh, right after World War One. In World War One, Japan was our ally. And the Germans, of course, were defeated. And they owned some islands out in the South Pacific. One of those was Chuk. But Germans couldn't say Chuk, so they said truck. Mm -hmm. So the islander said, okay, you're the boss now, I guess it's truck. Mm -hmm. So Truck Lagoon, many, many of you have probably heard of, it's actually a, it, it's a group of islands. That was in, uh, let's go ahead if you would please, Bob, thank you. The Mandate Islands, and they were called that because Japan wasn't given them to own, but Japan was allowed to uh, administer them under the mandate of the League of Nations from, in about 1920-22. And it included Micronesia, which is where uh, Truck Lagoon is. By the, name, by the way, they changed the name back to Chuk. Uh, and the Marshalls and some other groups of islands there. Okay, go ahead if you would, please. Uh, now, the atmosphere in Japan prior to, uh, between World War I and World War II, it's kind of helpful to understand that. First of all, the Japanese were very guarded about these islands. They didn't want anybody messing around there. You couldn't go there unless you were Japanese. In fact, uh, as an aside, we sent a Lieutenant Colonel Marine there as an intelligence gatherer, and he ended up dying there. Uh, and I guess they, they found out that he was, a, he was collecting intel. So you have these groups, this, this group of island, islands in the South Pacific. And uh, the Japanese uh, had an administrative base at Truk. Now later on, Truk became their sort of uh, the equivalent to our Pearl Harbor. During the war, it was an operational base. It was a huge complex, and you'll see that in a little bit. But in the 20s and 30s, it was one of the Mandate Islands. Uh, and all of you probably know about Air America, don't you? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Uh, well, Pan Am was the Air America of the 20s and 30s. If uh, they got the mail contract all the time to run the, the mail, and I don't care who you were, if you bid against Pan, Pan Am, you were going to lose. Because Pan Am was the, did some other things for the government. They financed it through this mail uh, carrier kind of thing. And, and so Pan Am decided, you know, we need, uh, we're going to run a commercial operation from San Francisco to China. And we're going to need bases in all these places across the South Pacific. Well, the rules of the, of the in these Mandate Islands uh, established by the League of Nations is you could not militarize them. So you couldn't build a military base. So we decided we needed seaplane bases. Now, we had one in Hawaii, which was in, of course, the territory. There was Midway, Guam, the, and then the Philippines, and then China. That was the route that this would take. Now, I can't see how this could have been commercially feasible at all, because it took a week to fly to China, and they took like 16 people on an airplane. Now, who can afford that? So, but anyway, this was the deal. We we're going to have a commercial operation flying from San Francisco to China. Well, the Japanese were not thrilled about this, because they knew what was going on here. This is going to go right through the South Pacific Islands that they're very guarded about. Before the first Pan Am Clipper was going to take off from San Francisco, the evening before that flight, two Japanese gentlemen were found monkeying with the uh, direction finder on the clipper and arrested by the FBI. So the Japanese were not at all supportive of the efforts of the United States to, to do this uh, across the Pacific thing. All right, go ahead. And that, 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 the point of that slide was that, that Japan was very so, you know, pro-Axis, uh, anti-American during the build-up to World War II. Now, Tony, would you point out truck on there? Uh, okay, let's see. 
one of these dots. You see Micronesia? Okay. Uh, yeah, the truck is actually in, in what is now the That's Federated... That's right. In fact, if you go there, you, you, you have to fly through Guam to get there. Uh, and that's sort of a, that's the route that I was talking to you about, that from San Francisco to Hawaii, Midway, Wake, Guam, Manila, and Hong Kong, or Macau. That was the route that this was, this, uh, was supposed to take. Okay, Bob. All right, and there's a picture of the uh, Pan Am, uh, you know, the flying clippers. They were big deals, huge airplanes. It was also the state of the art technology. In fact, on the Hawaii Clipper, the the the, the one that we're going to talk about, it had the very latest uh, Pratt and Whitney Wasp engines. They'd only been out like two months or something, and the airplane itself was a state of the art airplane. Go ahead, Bob. All right, and that's what it looks like from the side. I mean, this is amazing. This is, this is 1938, and this is what air travel was like in those days, okay? All right. Not exactly what you get in Delta Airlines today, is it? <laughs> okay, Bob. All right. And that's what uh, the airplane looks like at Anchor. It's a it's flying boat. Uh, full big engines, okay? Okay, now. And there's uh, the, the uh, story about the... Uh, the November 22nd, 1935, when the uh, two Japanese guys were found uh, on board the Clipper sabotaging the uh, direction finder. And then in 1936, only like two months after that, there was a Clipper sailing through a channel in San Francisco Bay and ran into some subsurface stuff that wasn't supposed to be there. It sliced the, the hull open. The Clipper didn't sink, but it was obviously sabotaged. Okay. All right. Now, Let's go now to uh, 1938. Uh, to, in 1938, we of course were not yet in World War II, but Japan was, and Japan had invaded Manchuria, and they were fighting in China. We were supportive of China, although we didn't want to do anything that would be perceived as taking a warlike action against Japan. You remember the American Volunteer Group, a bunch of, uh, otherwise known as the Flying Tigers, a bunch of American pilots flying American airplanes with Chinese markings against the Japanese and for, the, the, uh, for China. So Watson Choi was a Chinese national, he had become an American, changed his name to, well, to Watson Choi instead of Watson Choi, owned some restaurants in New York and New Jersey. And he was kind of the big deal in the group of Chinese Americans that he says wanted to support China against Japan, so they came up with three million dollars. Well, uh, it's pretty apparent that all the Chinese people in the country couldn't come up with three million dollars right after the Depression, but uh, I'm, I'm sure the government provided that money to them. And, uh, and in any event, three million dollars in gold certificates were in a suitcase with Wan San Choi on the Hawaii Clipper that left San Francisco in uh, July of 1938. Uh, also on that airplane was, uh, well, almost everybody on this crew had something to do with the intelligence community. The uh, co-pilot was uh, Mark Walker. Uh, who was a young man, had just become the youngest captain in Pan Am's fleet, had his, was getting his own clipper the next week. The first officer was sick, this, so Mark Walker took his place. Mark Walker was a Navy uh, flyer who I think was still in the reserves. He was dating Jane from Tarzan, you know, so the, the actress that played Jane, lived in Los Angeles, had a pretty good life. Uh, and apparently was a really uh, an expert pilot. He was one of the guys that helped Amelia Earhart learn long distance, how to fly long distances across the Pacific. And apparently his opinion is she, should, she shouldn't, have did, shouldn't have done that. But in any event, uh, the, uh, so we have Watson Choi, Mark Walker, and there's another man named Ted Wyman who's aboard. Ted Wyman was a lieutenant commander of the Navy Reserve in the intelligence business. And uh, he was the vice president of international sales of the Curtis Aircraft Company. You know, the same guys who built the planes that were flying in China against Japan. Uh, so you can kind of see how this is going. Watson Choi is taking this money to, probably Chiang Kai-shek, to the, to the 
to the Chinese government uh, to, as a donation. You can see that money's there's going to be a photo op, and that money's coming back on the next clipper with Ted Wyman and a bunch of uh, Curtis aircraft are going to be coming over to uh, China. Now, I, that's I mean that's just pretty apparent to figure out. It's not you know, there's nothing I read that said that. Okay, let's go ahead. All right. Uh, so, this is the Blon Island. It's in the, uh, the truck archipelago. And the Blon Island was the place where the Japanese in World War II had a huge military presence. There's a seaplane base there, which is, has some significance to this story and, and all kinds of other stuff. But let's back up a little bit. So, the Clipper takes off from San Francisco, and it heads across that route that I show you. It goes to, to Hawaii, and then to Wake, and then to Midway, uh, and then to Guam. Now, but it, it, when it took off from Guam uh, to, on its way to Manila, that was the last time it was seen. What happened was, as it was flying along, every, every 30 minutes they had to radio back in at their position report and, and weather and that kind of stuff. So we, we know exactly to the minute when the clipper disappeared because the, the radio operator was communicating with Manila and uh, doing their half, their half hour report uh, and saying, we're flying between cloud layers, uh, some rain, uh, but everything's fine. and. Uh, the guy Manila said, "I'd have weather for you," and the and the radio guy on the Clipper said, Hold, "Call back in one minute. I have rain static." That's the last they heard of the Clipper. It just it disappeared. It was never seen again. So when it didn't show up in Manila, of course, uh, after its fuel had been expended and enough time had elapsed that clearly it was no longer in the air. Uh, they began to look for it, and there was a. Uh, they knew they had. They knew where the clipper was supposed to have been, but that was a dead reckoning uh, position fix. I think maybe it was a because they couldn't have gotten a sun fix because they were below a cloud layer. Uh, so they sent a boat. And it was the 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 Megs USAT Megs. It's an army ship. It's a, tr a troop transport ship, and it, and it happened to be in the area, so they sent it to that location to try to find the, the clipper. So the clipper, the, the Megs gets to that location, looks around, and sees this big oil slick. All right, so it seems pretty apparent that the clipper's crashed, right, and produce this oil slick. You would think that. So, but then somebody did something that was unforeseen, and that changed this whole sort of analysis. They took a sample of the oil that was floating on the ocean. Uh, and sent it back to be analyzed. Well, it, it took some time for that analysis, but the, the, the bottom line is that oil did not match the oil on the clipper. All right, so. Uh, and the airplane was not seen again. That was 1938. In 1964, a guy named Joe Graveris, who was an, an Air Force officer stationed in the South Pacific, uh, was at Truck Lagoon. And he was looking for Amelia Earhart. And he hired a local uh, guide whose name was Robert Naroon to take him out to a location in a swamp where he had heard there was a twin-engine airplane. And there was a twin-engine airplane, but it wasn't the Electra. It was a Betty Bomber or something. It didn't have anything to do with Amelia Earhart. So the guide says to him, you know, I know you're disappointed because you didn't find what you were looking for, but are you interested in those 13 Americans buried here? And he says, what? What 13 Americans? He says, oh, yeah. He says, well, before the war, I was a contractor. And uh, the Japanese were building buildings here. Now, this is when it was in the administrative phase before it became a forward operating base for the military. He says, the, the, the Japanese uh, government hired me uh, to pour a concrete slab for a building that later became the, their naval hospital. So one morning, I showed up there with my buddy, Mori, and the concrete. And the Japanese military was there, and that's u unusual because they usually weren't. Was it, was it a military facility? And 
they had the formers laid out for the concrete. And inside the formers were the bodies of 13 men. Some were wearing uniforms. There was one guy that was Asian. There was another guy that was kind of a darker skin, a darker complexion than the others. Uh, and they were laid out face down. The Japanese told us to pour concrete over them. So we poured the concrete foundation of that building over those bodies, and then we left. You know, that, it, yeah, that kind of spooked them a little bit, I think. Uh, so Graveris doesn't really know how to connect this up. He doesn't know anything about the source of those bodies. Or, uh, so he says, can you show me the slab? And they said, yes. Now, uh, they took him to a slab. I, I don't know what the sequence was. But Bob, could you go ahead and... and uh, all right, that's another view of DeBlon. We'll talk about that in a minute. The, uh, so they take him to this uh, slab. and There had been a building on it. That building was no longer there. And he took a picture of the slab. And that picture is in this sequence someplace, I think. Uh, the, uh, so the Graveris moved on. He thought, I, you know, I don't know what this is about. It's pretty interesting. And, I'll, I'll, and he, made, he made notes, and he had a map, and he, he made a mark on his map about where that slab was. But then he went off to look for Amelia Earhart. Never found her. Ended up, uh, he retired, went to, I've forgotten where he lived. And then in 1980, I think, four, uh, there was a book called The China Clipper. It was really about the Hawaii Clipper, and it was the story of this missing clipper. Uh, Graveris read that book, and he goes, oh, wow, this is, this is, these are the 13 people, because it, it matched exactly the crew of the Clipper, down to the one Asian guy who was Watson Choi, who was not a crewman, but he was a passenger. Uh, it, there's a seaplane base there. It makes sense. And given the Japanese interest in stymieing this operation, it makes sense that they would do something like that. The theory is, and nobody really knows, I mean, a lot of this is, is a mystery, and, and, I, and I'm not here to tell you what happened, because I don't know any more than you do about what really happened. I just know the facts that I'm relating to you, and then you have to come to your own conclusions about how that, you know, how that may have turned out. But the theory is that some, in, in Guam, some people, a couple of, of uh, Japanese guys snuck aboard the, the clipper and hid, and then uh, hijacked it someplace between Guam and Manila. Flew it to the seaplane base at De Blon Island with truck and truck lagoon. There, the, the crew and, and, and passengers were executed, buried in that slab, and the airplane was then reportedly taken to Japan for to be reverse engineered. Now I say reportedly because Ted Wyman, when he was in college, had a roommate. His roommate's name was Sutherland. And General Sutherland turned out to be the chief of staff to Douglas MacArthur, who was uh, in charge of the Philippines. Or, I'm sorry, the, the Japan, right after World War II. And Sutherland visited Ted Wyman's widow and told her, now this is, this is all like somebody in the family told somebody that this is what happened, that they had found the clipper, or parts of the clipper at least, in Japan. And they had taken it there because it, they had taken it back there to disassemble it, and particularly the engines were of interest to them. Uh, now, some years ago, I, I, I was uh, in naval intelligence and uh, as a reservist, and one of the... Uh, uh, Another naval intelligence reserve officer is named Guy Knopfsinger. Guy was taking a course at DIA in, uh, to get a, a degree in a master's degree in strategic intelligence. So he had to do this thesis. So he thought he'd do something fun. He was doing a thesis on uh, the Navy's involvement in the search for Amelia Earhart. While he's doing that, he's reading all that stuff, and he stumbles upon this story. He goes, this is way more interesting than the Earhart thing. You know, so he did his thesis on this topic. And then uh, he went to a uh, truck. And uh, Robert Naroon was in his 70s back in 1964, 
He was at around when uh, Guy got there. I think somewhere around, around 2002. I'm, I don't remember the date or, the, or even the year. So uh, and nobody there remembered it. But he talked to the families of those people. He said, oh, yeah, or, you know, D Dad told me that story you know, about that. And there was a lot of stuff happening back here that Japanese, the Japanese were doing in those days. Uh, and he looked for he looked around and, he could, and, and okay we had a picture of this slab but where where could this be? So he came back and then and then uh, a, a, a mutual friend that was helping him with that came to me and said and, and told me about it and and uh, the next time so then uh, Nofsinger and I went back uh, I don't even remember what year that was maybe 2012 you know or, or maybe even earlier. And at first, it, 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 we were looking for the slab. And we were wandering around the jungle. We knew kind of, we had Graveris' map. Knopfsinger went to Graveris' family, and they said, yeah, we have all Graveris' notes and maps and stuff like that. So we got copies of them. So Knopfsinger and I are wandering around the jungle, wondering where this slab could be. But here's the deal. All right, you see what that looks like? That looks like Manhattan or something, at least that part of it, all these buildings and stuff. You know, and the now it's just all jungle. Uh, go ahead, Bob. What's the date of this photo? That's 1944, I think. Now, okay. and and because in 1944 we bombed the snot out of the place in February in Operation, I think it was Hailstone. Uh, and I think that was probably a reconnaissance photo prior to that. Okay, now and that's what it looks like today. Completely different. So imagine this. Let's say you take Manhattan, you remove all the buildings, and you cover it with vines. Go back in 70 years and find the donut shop. All right? I mean, that's kind of what this is like. And you stand there in the jungle, and you see something that's a little bit misshapen or doesn't look right. So you go over to it, and you pull the vines off, and guess what? It's a, it's, it's a concrete pillar. Then you look around, and you go, there's another one. And, it, and, pretty, and then you see that there's a pattern to all this. And, and one of the things we found was it was probably a barracks or something because it had concrete steps here, here, and here, and then pillars and nothing else because all the wood was gone. All right. Uh, all right, go ahead, please, if you would, Bob. Uh, that's the Megs. Okay, go ahead. Okay, now, this is Graveris' picture of the slab. But here's what's important. You can, you can barely see that there is a post, a concrete post down to the left. And what Guy Knopfsinger had done was he had, had this like manipulated to bring out what's in the dark there. Mm -hmm. And there is in fact a post there and it has unique markings where it's been, yeah, and, and what these were were places where the Japanese had put up a signpost saying this is the hospital and this is the library. I don't know if they had a library. This is a whatever it is, all right? Uh, and that becomes significant because the rest is just a, I mean, it's just a concrete slab. So we're going around all these concrete slabs and uh, measuring them because we, uh, uh, Graveris had measured the slab. We knew the orientation. We knew the size. And then we found a place that was the hospital. The locals were helping us sort, sort this out. Well, it turns out that the hospital wasn't just a hospital. It was a hospital complex with 20-something buildings. Not only that, there were 20 more hospitals because everything that they called a hospital could have been an aid station. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of linking some things together here. I think that we probably, we, and, and later on we, we got a map of that area showing all the hospitals. That's how we knew that there were actually 20 of them after our, our second trip. And I think we probably got that because we wanted to know where the hospitals were because we could not bomb them under the Geneva Convention. And I'm going to guess we had a POW, you know, a, a Japanese POW or somebody tell us here are the locations of the hospital, and that's why there ended up being a map with the hospitals noted on them. But anyway, all right, go ahead, Bob. Uh, okay, well, on the surface of the ocean. Uh, must be at the bottom of the sea. Okay, go ahead, Bob. Now, that is the house that now sits on the slab. Because what it, it and this all gets a little bit confusing because, oh, let me go back and tell you why we think we, we're pretty sure we found the slab. 
and this was this is a needle in a haystack kind of thing. We're looking, uh, you know, we were wandering around looking, you know, pulling vines off stuff, trying to find this place, looking for the hospital, and then we uh, after. Uh, guy had the photo work done on the post and it became kind of clear that it were different you know unique marks to the post we put it out to the locals say anybody know where this is and one of the guys that works at the dive shop at a place called the blue lagoon in in truck said that's my aunt's house <laughs> really so the third trip you know, the guy's third trip, my second trip there, we just walked right to the place. You know, we got on a boat, the guy says, yeah, I'll show you where that is. And we go, sure as hell, that's the place. And that, that because the, that the unique scars and marks on that post were still there, but the, the, the part, the top of the post had been damaged more than in the picture. So we asked the locals about, hey, did this have a, was this completely rounded at one time? And they said, yeah, but about, fi about 15 years ago, it was this hurricane. And it knocked a tree down on it, and knocked a chunk out of the top of it. So we're pretty sure this was the, that this is the site. Now, the problem is, though, is that the slab? Because when they put that slab there in 1938, and then there was a building on it, that building went away either in Operation Hailstone or uh, just by the years of whatever. And then uh, another building was built there. But they were told that uh, that slab may have been to some extent cannibalized. And they, they may have taken some of the concrete and moved it to some place else. We're not sure about that. But anyway, you can see this big pile of dirt there. Because that's where they jackhammered up the floor of this building and looking for those bodies. Now, we didn't expect to find the airplane, but we thought we might find the bodies and repatriate them. Okay, Bob. Uh, and that's the inside of the house. The house was, it, uh, I don't want to say it was abandoned, but it wasn't lived in. Uh, and we agreed to pay you know, the damage when a bunch of the local guys helped us tear it up. Okay. All right, so that's, that's what it looks like now. Beautiful place. Uh, but the long and short of it is that we didn't find any bodies under that slab. There were some things that were found there that indicated it was a medical facility. There were little medicine uh, bottles and, and that sort of thing. Okay. That, that's it? Okay. That's the story. Any questions? What, what comes next? Well... Uh, by the way, there is a website, and it's called lostclipper.com. Uh, so you might, well, if you want to see how this progresses, you can go to lostclipper.com and watch it. Uh, and I think that there's uh, Netflix may have some interest in uh, following up on this, and the uh, two uh, DEA agents who. Uh, track down Pablo Escobar or, or, or assisting in the investigation to, you know, to determine what, what might have happened here. You know, it's really a shame that we don't, it, it, whoever, the people that know this, that have first-hand knowledge of this, are likely to be really old or dead. This is 1938. The people that, I mean, there may be some local people that were children at the time that remembered things there. But anybody who would be senior enough to have been involved in the planning or execution of this event would probably be 100 years old or better by now. Uh, so I don't know that we will ever know. Uh, but I think that it is certainly a mystery, isn't it? Any plans to go back? Yes. Really? Yeah. Uh, actually, I think that they, uh, it, it's kind of expensive to go there, so, uh, and none of us are wealthy people, so, uh, I think there, there was an effort on Kickstarter to, uh, you know, to get some money for this, and I think maybe the deal with Netflix or something, if they're going to do that, would, would perhaps generate some revenue that would allow us to go back. Okay. Uh, all right. Any, anything else? Are you 100% sure that the one you dug up is the one? The one what? The slab? Yeah. Oh, I'm not 100% sure of anything. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, here, here's, here's, you know, it, it is, I'd like to say I'm 100% sure, but I'm not. But I can say that, that, that it is, there is a strong 
I, I won't say I'm certain about it, but I can tell you that that slab 